All right, welcome back. Chaotically Intolerant, episode 161. Mike is back here. We got our midweek episode. We are going to start the show off with um, NFL draft talk for a little bit, probably about 15 minutes. And then the rest of the episode will cover uh, Major League Baseball. So everything that's going on in baseball, Mike Trout pop probably being done for the year or possibly being done for the year. Uh, you know, I mean, the Rays, Rays and Brewers, weirdest organizations to have a fight. Um, but they had a big fight. So make sure to like, comment, subscribe, the whole thing. And uh, let's go. So. The NFL draft. The NFL is king. That's why we're covering the NFL before we cover baseball on this show. Um, the NFL is absolute. They're kings. Uh, Roger Goodell has already said he's wants to go to the 20 week regular season with the two two bye weeks, 18 weeks of total play, two reg- or preseason games, and a President's Day weekend Super Bowl, which is the one thing I am in favor of. I mean, at this point, with the traditional 16 game thing ruined forever. You might as well. I mean, that it's already heading in that direction. And I think uh, it was Richard Sherman and, you know, some of the veterans had had speculated that the whole 17 was just a, a bridge to sort of, you know, the NFL's, I think, I mean, it's not that they didn't ask for what they wanted. They, they pushed for 18 games back before the CBA was signed in 2011. Um, and then they kind of, settled, if you will, for 17, knowing that they'll get the younger generation to sign off. Um, I think that makes sense, actually. President's Weekend, Super Bowl, um, it's already a huge travel weekend, a holiday weekend for most people. Uh, kind of makes sense, yeah. I mean, I, it, if you're going to do it, you might as well. I mean, the NFL, if it were up to them, they'd play every week of the year, and maybe sometime in the next 200, 300 years, we might see that. But for now, I think... Uh, seems like a more reasonable goal. Yeah. Um, also, President's Day will line up with Valentine's Day. They're, they're always going to be in the same area, which is not good for men overall. Um, I was hearing a Saturday Super Bowl as well, a possible Saturday Super Bowl, which is not – that's not something I want ever. I never want to see that. Saturday is not for, for NFL. It's just not. Yeah. I mean, it would make sense if you're not going to move it to President's Weekend um, or if you're not going to make the Monday a national holiday. So yeah. I would say uh, it's probably not going to happen ever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the NFL draft, let, let me pull up my draft board, actually. But I mean, I think Michael Penix is the number one. What the fuck's going on? Which I match. I understand what they're doing. Um Kirk coming off an uh, Achilles injury. That's not exactly a guarantee that he'll be super, super healthy for the next few years. Um, you know, Achilles is really hard to come back from. Uh, what What did you think about it? You know, just the, the draft in general? Uh, 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 Michael Penix specifically. Oh, specifically. Sorry. Um, well, I don't know. I mean, it was like a big deal when they signed Kirk Cousins and it, it, everything was kind of like pointing towards the Falcons having, you know, their quarterback supposedly in place for the next few years. But clearly everybody knows that Kirk Cousins is not the answer. I don't know how Minnesota didn't know that when they gave him $28 million a year. Um, I think Penix probably would have fallen if the Falcons had waited. I mean, I get they, I get that they didn't want to take that risk. Mm-hmm. But um, it's funny. I mean, you just you, – you don't expect – a team to jump aggressively to move up in the draft after signing a quarterback. Usually it's you sign a quarterback, then you draft the guy that, you know, you know, you're going to get, and you don't have to give up anything because you already gave up a lot to sign Kirk cousins. You've already committed a lot of money to him. So I was, it, it kind of baffled me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, again, like if he, let's say Kirk obviously plays his entire contract, which is a four year contract which I think there is an opt-out after year two in Kirk's contract. Um, he will be 28 years old, I think, was the, was the age, which is, I mean, a 28-year-old rookie quarterback or, a, you know, first-time starter is 
crazy, but I, I think they're kind of assuming Kirk will only play the two years of the deal and then Penix will start in what would have been the third year. Yeah, I think there's no harm in letting your quarterback sit for multiple years. Aaron Rodgers did it. Um, Carson Palmer did it. Uh, you know, you ha- if they feel like Cousins is going to opt out or get hurt or retire or whatever after the first couple of years, then – I mean, it looks like a genius move. Um, I just, I wouldn't have thought they would have gone after such a, a big name as kind of a stopgap quarterback, you know? I mean, I, I don't, I, there's no right answer as far as when to start a guy. I mean, we've seen Andrew Luck step right in, take a team to the playoffs. That was, you know, won two games the previous year. Um, and then, like I said, guys like Rodgers and Palmer who waited for a few years before they got their shot and they were they groomed and they learned there's just, there's no real playbook on it. I think you cut out there. Oh, I can hear you. Okay. I just what, what did you say after there's just no, there's just no real playbook for how to, you know, when and how to get your rookie or young quarterback into the mix. Yeah. Um, and I get speaking of young quarterbacks. So first we had six quarterbacks taken in the first round, which ties, tied the record for, what was it, 83? The Elway, yeah, the Elway draft with Marino and, and all those legendary quarterbacks. So it's obviously guaranteed if you take a lot of quarterbacks in the first round, most of them are going to work out <laughs> based on past history. Um, obviously, Caleb Williams got taken number one. I think that was, you know, according to Max, when we talked to him a, a few months ago, I think that was a slam dunk number one pick. Um, a story came out today that he broke a coach's wedding band in high school, throwing a ball so hard. So mm. again, clearly if we know anything about that. He's going to be successful. Uh, um, but Jaden Daniels at two, am I, I, I'm not a fan of Jaden Daniels. It, it feels weird. Like, cause the Heisman pit, if you win the Heisman, you are theoretically the best player in college football at the time. And right. it also feels like Heisman's, like when you say that, it should be, oh, that guy won the Heisman. He should be the number one pick, slam dunk, 100%, no problem. But that's just never, ever true. Like it's just, it's rare that a Heisman pick translates as the number one best player in the NFL. Um, and Jaden Daniels has the weird elbow, but I'm not super big on him, I guess. Like, I don't know why. It just doesn't seem right to me. Wow, neither is the Washington Post. They uh, put out an article about the Commanders slash Redskins, you know, checkered or history of you know checkered past quarterbacks. You know, they've uh, Dwayne Haskins that obviously and sad what happened to him, but uh, didn't work out from a quarterback perspective. RG three did for a minute. Jason Campbell not so much. Patrick Ramsey I remember uh, not so much. It's and uh, Heath Schuler just going back in time. So. Um, yeah, it's interesting, and he's not—he's not a big guy, right? I mean, someone was telling me he was on some podcast or something. Yeah, he's and, not massive. But someone was telling me he's like Kevin Hart was joking that he's like bulkier than Jaden Daniels or something. He was had him on his podcast. I don't know, but he's uh, six foot four, one eighty one. That's that is incredible. That's like um, the Eagles had a receiver, Todd Pinkston, about twenty years ago, who was noted for being very tall and extremely skinny. And he was, he had a little bit of, you know, alligator arms over the middle and can understand why that size. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I didn't expect that to be the commander's choice, at least not as of, you know, maybe a month ago, if you had asked me, I would have thought they would have gone after maybe Drake may who obviously in, fell in comparison to Caleb Williams. Caleb Williams is six foot one but he's 216 pounds. He has a lot more weight on him. Right. So that's, that's, I mean, 181 pounds for any player in the NFL besides like a speedy wide receiver seems crazy yeah. light or a kicker. Yeah. Or punter. One of those few, um, Drake may to new England. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, this, this makes more sense than anything for the Patriots to take Drake may North Carolina kid, white kid, how often are we going to see the Patriots draft uh, a quarterback of another color? Um, but then they drafted Joe Milton, who he can throw an orange over 100 yards on the fly. So 
Well, that's Patriots, all I need to know. They tried it with Cam Newton, and then back in the day before Brady was the the hero, they had a big um, they had big hopes for Michael Bishop, who you know was a decorated player at Kansas State, I think, and and he was the guy that was ahead of Brady on the depth chart. So maybe they're maybe they just have looked at that and they said, well, we're we're sticking with, uh, I don't know, but. Um, anyway, uh, the Cam Newton experience worked for like six games. Like he started out. Year, he was good. Yeah, he started out well. It, at that time, he looked like he could still play. Um, and I don't believe we've seen him in the league since, have we? I mean, I think maybe Carolina picked him up the next year, brought him back. Yeah, he, but he had a horrible, horrible stretch with Carolina. I think maybe that year or the year after, they grabbed him. He had yeah. one. His his first game back was against Arizona. And I think he had a couple rushing touchdowns and he's like, he scores one touchdown and he's screaming into the camera. I'm back. I'm back. Like, like it was some big thing. And then he ended up throwing like double the interceptions and touchdowns. I'm pretty sure. Mm. Yeah. Not good. Not good at all. Um, uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. Ohio state slam dunk, I think is a wide receiver as a Colts fan. My homerism was like, we should trade the entire draft. For this mm-hmm. game. Um, but my smart football mind was I was like, if we're gonna trade up, you're gonna trade up for Brock Bowers over anyone else. Um, but the Cardinals in four years he will not be a Cardinal. I know that, um, because they're the Cardinals <laughs> and they'll do something stupid. Um, but they're gonna have him for four years. So great, great pick, and then Joe Alt at a Notre Dame too. I th- I love that pick for the Chargers. Chargers fans were upset, but how you need to build the trenches before you build anything else. And I think uh, Harbaugh knows that more than anybody. Yeah. I, I think it's always safer to go that route too. I mean, they're not going to draft a quarterback, at least not early, you know, they they got to develop, well, they got to protect Justin Herbert, you know, they're going to invest in this kid. They absolutely have to. Uh, I thought that was a good pick for the chargers. Giants taking Malik neighbors, neighbors already. I, I'm pretty sure he already took a picture on a yacht, which if you know about the history of Giants receivers and yachts, it's not good. Uh, OBJ famously took that picture on the yacht, and I think they lost like eight games in a row right after that, and they have not been the same. The Giants have not been the same since. Um, so he clearly has not learned whatsoever. The Vikings had the love boat back in 2005 that kind of derailed their season, but um, I don't know about the Giants' history with yachts. I'll have to read up on that. The NBA has a good history. The what was it? The banana boat with LeBron and Dwayne Wade and a bunch of other superstars. Um, so the NBA good with boats. The NFL don't go on a boat if you're playing in the NFL. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think um, what do you call it? Uh, Latrell Sprewell, NBA. He had his yacht seized at some point. I forget the story there. That's not good. Anyway. Uh, Titans taking J.C. Lantham, offensive tackle. They need all the help they can get on the offensive line. I think that's a great pick. The only other one I would say is take a wide receiver, but this wide receiver class, how I'm hearing people talk about this wide receiver class is it's going to be equivalent to that, I think, 1983 quarterback class. Of, hmm. There's It's one of the deepest in history, um, so I don't mind them taking that there. Penix, obviously, to Atlanta. Romy, uh, Rome Oduns going to Chicago. That's Chicago. Chicago's loaded. <laughs> Chicago is loaded. Yeah. I think if if you're smart and you're in your fantasy draft, you might want to take Caleb Williams with the number one pick this year and take a gamble. Because mm-hmm. think about all the weapons they have now. Uh, what the hell is his name? Jo- uh, DJ Moore, Romo Duns. Um, who uh, I think they added another uh, Mike Williams or uh, Keenan, Keenan Allen. Allen. Sorry, not Mike Williams. Mm-hmm. Who's their tight end? What the hell is his name? Cole Komet. Cole Komet, monster. Uh, their defense, I mean, they've, they've been getting stronger and stronger on defense. They extended Jalen Johnson this year. So Chicago, like, they might not be Super Bowl caliber yet because Caleb Williams is so young. But this roster for the next three, four years, they're looking at a possible Super Bowl title. Here. Yeah, finally, an exciting time to be a Bears fan. And finally, maybe the Bears have their great elite quarterback that they could have Patrick Mahomes if they wanted, but they didn't take him. They took Trubisky, and well, here they are six years later, hoping that they made, or uh, seven years later, hoping that they made the right choice. Um, yeah. 
Uh, and then, but the Vikings, you know, in the division, they they got their guy too. Maybe McCarthy. JJ, oh brother, I would say he was the best. Uh, if if you look at their quarterback right, room right now, you plug JJ McCarthy in there, he is the best quarterback um, for this season. Mm-hmm. So that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> There's not a lot of competition, but. Right. Have no clue about Olu Fashunu, um, but I will say that the offensive line was the main thing that the Jets needed to tackle, and they did that. So good job to the Jets. You made the right decision. Yeah, who's making Uh, that pick, the GM or Aaron Rodgers? What'd you say? I think you cut out again. Yeah, I said who was making that pick, the GM or Aaron Rodgers? Oh, yeah, definitely, 100%. Um, Brock or Bo Nix to Denver. This is the exact same situation, in my opinion, as J.J. McCarthy. Uh, Bo Nix walking into that quarterback room is the number one quarterback, talent-wise, at least. Um, He was the best option for them at this very moment, which, again, like, I don't mind. I mean, you could have say, you could say take a receiver there, take anything else, but he's making your team better at that point, so... That's good. I have no clue about this guy from the Saints, Talis Fua- Fuaga. Fuaga. Um, heard great things. So the Saints are the most boring team, I think, right now in the league. There is nothing interesting to say about the Saints. Uh, the Colts taking an edge rusher who was medically retired three years ago. Latu, Latu, Latu. Listen, he's a great talent if he can stay healthy. The guy also had the same neck surgeon as Peyton Manning did in 2011. If that wasn't a sign to not draft this kid, I, I don't really know. I Again, I hope he works out. I really do hope he works out, obviously, for my team, but also for him. That would be an awesome comeback story. You know your cornerback. Your cornerbacks are an issue. Like, you can, you can point to how much talent they have there, but they couldn't stay healthy last year. And health is just as important. Availability is just as important as your skill. Um, and we were... We had issues, a lot of issues in, in the secondary. We did not take the white Jesus of cornerbacks, Cooper DeGene, which made it to the second round, which was kind of shocking. Uh, but I was really hoping that we would take Cooper DeGene. I just wanted to cover the top 15. And then also the Buffalo Bills trading back with the Chiefs was also hilarious, just to let them get Xavier Worthy. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's just at this point, try not to worry about the chiefs until January, but you know, with Hollywood Brown, you know, now worthy, I don't know. I don't know if anyone's gonna be able to stop him again. And and people are saying, Oh, he's just John Ross, basically like he's going to be bad. Uh, the chiefs know what to do with like, like gadget players. They are the Patriots. That's what we've been saying. They know how to use these guys with their best skill. And speed is going to be a – I mean, obviously, it's a problem. Like, they're going to abuse this guy's speed. And he's obviously not built like Tyreek. He's not built – you know, he's skinny, and you can put on weight. You can put on muscle. All you got to do is hope this guy's healthy, even if he has bad hands. Like, we saw what the Chiefs did with some of the worst hands from receivers I've ever seen, and they won the fucking Super Bowl. So, it's a problem that they picked up worthy. Uh, <laughs> it is, and people are trying to – cope with it they're trying to be in denial about it but them picking up one of the fastest players in the draft i don't care that's not good simple as that yeah and and buffalo picked up a pretty fast receiver too right yeah i mean he's not i mean i'm not i'm also like trying not to shit on what who buffalo picked but they're passing i mean xavier were the chiefs getting xavier worthy is a problem and especially also that the bills traded the patrick mahomes pick as well to the Chiefs. That's how yeah. the Chiefs got Patrick Mahomes. Right. It's just like, it is little brother syndrome again and again and again and again for the Buffalo Bills. It's, yeah, too early to be worrying about it now, but yeah, you just, you have a bad feeling that we might be in for just a, a three-peat, more Taylor Swift, all that. Kelsey got a two-year extension. Yeah. Yeah, he, um, I, I texted a buddy of mine and I was like, why did you guys resign you guys just wasted money on a washed up tight end and he was like i'll t- I'll take that for maybe another super bowl i was like all right bud 
Okay. We'll see how, how Travis really plays this year. Um, let's move on to baseball sport that is happening this year, which the schedule release is coming soon as well for the NFL. So hmm. um, probably within the next couple of weeks, um, which again, the schedule release is just Adam Schefter leaking every single game. Right. That's, that's, that's what it's become, which kind of sucks, honestly. <clears throat> but let's talk baseball. The Boston Red Sox have gotten hot again. And I'm feeling they're going to start, they're going to lose about five of six coming up in the next week because that's just what they do. They're a streaky team. But the starting pitching has been dominant, to say the least. Yeah. I mean, they're, what's their uh, team ERA? Their rotation ERA is like two, I think. I think they have the best rotation ERA in the game. Um, it's incredible because of all the injuries they've had. And I, I mean, I don't know how Red Sox fans actually feel about Alex Cora, but I feel like he has just been a, an amazing manager. He has always gotten what I feel like is the most out of them. 2021 was his masterpiece more than even 2018 when he, but you know, even then, because John Farrell's teams had lost in the division series the previous two years. And yeah, obviously they got better in 2018, especially picking up JD Martinez um, cause they didn't hit a lot of homers the year before, but they are really piecing it together. I, I, I gotta say that's gotta be a team to be proud of. I mean, you get, I love when teams overachieve. I hate teams like the Minnesota twins, the Tampa Bay Rays, the Toronto blue Jays, the Milwaukee Brewers teams that perennially waste a playoff spot because they, to me, it's like they almost try to beat the system and system can't be beat. It can't. This whole money ball thing is great. They made a movie about it. They left out the part that the Oakland A's did have not gone to any World Series in the Moneyball era. And the you know, the Red Sox, it's kind of the opposite, right? Like they they don't always make the posts like the Dosekis guy. They don't always make the postseason, but when they do, well, they sure make the most of it. And everyone, I know you were upset. They didn't do anything in the offseason, seemingly, and they didn't get Jordan Montgomery, they didn't get this guy and this guy, and yet Again, I know it's April or May 1st, technically, but then they could completely collapse like a house of cards. But they're doing better than a lot of teams like Houston, for example, who also has a bunch of pitching injuries, has most of their rotation on the injured list. And what's their excuse to be 10 and 19, whereas the Red Sox are mm -hmm. whatever, 16 and 13. And, you know, they, maybe they just said, hey, it's not that we're cheap and we want, you know, we don't want to pay for Jordan Montgomery, but hey, Cutter Crawford's got a 135 ERA. Tanner Houck's got a 1.6 ERA. I don't think anyone expected them that, you know, even after one month, have two guys in the top 10 in uh, starters ERA. I, I want to say maybe it was Nick Pavetta said they think he could, he has the stuff to win the Cy Young within the next couple of years, um, which isn't a shock because he has still been equated to a right handed. Chris Sale, like a prime right-handed Chris Sale, mm -hmm. which he also has the injuries associated with Chris Sale already. Um, right. But the Red Sox have had two shutouts in the last three games, which is insane that, again, we came into this season, Red Sox fans in general came into this season saying, our batting is going to be fine. That is not going to be our issue. Our pitching is going to be a fucking problem. Our starting rotation is question questionable at best. I mean – I think if more deeper Red Sox fans like Caleb, I think mentioned to me a few times, he was like, listen, this rotation is going to be better than, than you think. Majority of people said the overall pitching is going to be horrible. And they have a two, five, nine team ERA right now. That's including the bullpen who has struggled as well. So this it's, it's fun when, again, I, I agree. I love watching teams overachieve. It's awesome when it's my team. But when you look at a team like the Guardians as well, they're overachieving big time. I think I know they lost two or three to the Braves this weekend, but it's not like they were getting shelled. They I think they lost four three on Sunday and a close one on Friday night as well. So it's not watching these like even an AL Central team overachieve is a lot of fun. Well, yeah, most of the Central teams this year have been overachieving, which clearly they have to because nobody ever expects the Central teams to do anything, uh, but Detroit uh, won again today. They're 18 and 13. They're overachieving. They're not, they're, I don't want to say offensively challenged, but they're not a star studded offensive team. They're doing it with pitching. Kansas City set a franchise record for most wins in April with 17, I think. Uh, yeah, I, like it bothers me that Minnesota has won 10 in a row because 
it's like they should be banned from the playoffs. They are you – know, I, I mean, I guess they do overachieve in the sense that they probably aren't good, but they they have an absolute ceiling every year on how good they can be. Same with Milwaukee for the most part. Um, I want to talk about the A's for a second because I – had a chance to see them twice in person in the in the last week, actually. Saw them in New York and saw them in Baltimore. That they, they, they shut out the Yankees in one of those games. They got shelled in the other one. But they have right now, and again, it's only May 1st, but right now probably the most lethal one-two bullpen punch in the game with Lucas Urseg, Ur, Urkeg, Urseg and uh, Mason Miller, who – is just downright disgusting. If you've watched this kid pitch, he's 25. He's throwing I'm shocked he hasn't been sent down already. What's that? I'm shocked he hasn't been sent down to the minors already. Right, or traded, you know, to the Dodgers yeah. or the Yankees. But, um, I mean, I don't know if the A's are actually going to contend. I mean, they're only 14 and 17. It's not like they're – but it feels like they're setting the world on fire. I think they've won – I don't know. They took two out of three in Baltimore. They won the game. They won like they won five out of six. Row. Yeah, and they split four with the Yankees. So um, they're, you know, their last year in Oakland might as well party like it's the early 1970s. But um, it's been fun to watch. But I'll tell you, you know, they, if if they keep these two guys, if they stay healthy, always big if, especially with young pitchers, um, they're going to be a problem for a lot of teams. And they could spoil a lot of teams. Now, they may not really contend for the AL West, but as these teams are – Fighting, you know, Texas and maybe Houston gets back in at Seattle. They they can mess some things up. And if you fall behind the A's with these two guys, man, like it's it's not it doesn't look like a fluke. It just looks like they are absolutely shutting every single team down in the eighth and ninth innings right now. So, hey, good on them. Good on Mark Kotze. I always liked him as a player. Um, exciting to see them. Uh, what from a standings perspective, they're four. So they're like three games <laughs> ahead of the Astros right now. Even after a month, that brings a smile to my face. Even though Houston's won three straight, um, <laughs> Oakland is playing. They're three and a half out of first right now. They're three and a half out of first. Seattle, Seattle's pitching's been great too. That's been one of the best kept secrets. Um, as as well as the Red Sox have pitched this year, um, Seattle's uh, starter ERA is fourth. Uh, 3.22 I'm looking and you know their bullpen's been uh, just as good also fourth and that's without Matt Brash who's probably out for the year they don't score runs I mean the problem is like where how are the Mariners going to generate enough offense to win that division they are fourth uh, tied for third fewest runs um, and then if you kind of just go down the list of you know they thought they would get more from Mitch Garver who's hitting under 200 and or uh, Polanco's hitting 170 and Cal Raleigh's hitting 227. So they're not getting a whole lot. Julio Rodriguez struck out three times last night. He's at 256. Like they, they're not going to win the division if they don't score enough runs. Their pitching cannot single handedly carry them. But right now, I still think Texas is the best team in that division. Um, and yeah, they're playing pretty well and they're not like setting the world on fire. Um, but it would be a shame because Seattle, who knows how to waste a good opportunity like the Seattle Mariners? The only. Major League team to not play in a World Series. Just yeah. wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, um, I want to. I want to touch on. You said that the Royals set a franchise record for wins in April with yep. seventeen. I know it doesn't see well. It, it it doesn't seem like a whole lot. And even when they won the World Series, I'm guessing that that year. I know they started like on April 6th or 7th that year. So I just read it on, yeah, MLB, I saw it this morning. I was like, that's definitely worth uh, mentioning. But yeah, Royal set franchise record, 17th win in April behind Reagan's stellar outing. Who knew? That but is insane. Good for the Royals. <laughs> crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, so most in any month they've had since June of 2017, that was when they were, their core was just starting. That was the last year that they had Kane, Hosmer, and uh, who's the other guy that left? Mustakas. So Gordon. Oh. Well, I mean they had yeah, they, they had Gordon with the bullpen guys were starting to yeah. go. I think Wade Davis may have left that year or the year after. But anyway, yeah, and and last year's Royals didn't win their seventeenth game until May twenty ninth. So kind of like the A's who were what? The A's were like ten and forty five to start last year. These teams can turn it around quickly. And I mean baseball is just a lot of great stories. I was looking at the the Brewers game earlier and how about Colin Ray? So he pitched, he's got an ERA in like the low threes. 
He pitched in 2016. He was part of a trade. And I think it had something to do with his medicals weren't disclosed. He didn't pitch again until 2020. And he pitched in 2021 as well. And then he didn't pitch. It was either 22 or 23 where he didn't pitch. And now he's pitching really well for the Brewers. And you just don't, you don't get that in football. I mean, you certainly wouldn't get that in football because guys aren't going to come out of retirement. You know, it's like physically your skills would decline unless maybe you're a kicker. Um, and that is what's great about baseball, that you can see stories like that. And Albert Suarez for the Orioles, 34 years old, and, you know, there he went a long time between pitching in the majors and then hadn't started since late, you know, sometime early last year, I think. So, yeah, a lot of good stories. Yeah, Cam, Cam Boozer as well for the Red Sox, mm -hmm. uh, 31, made his Major League debut. Wow. He had He got into a car accident while healing from a torn labrum, sir, like from surgery for that. So, and that was in 2017 when he stepped away from baseball, he started coaching youth baseball and realized he could touch the nineties or hit like throw in the nineties without any pain. Um, that's when he came back. So he just had control issues at that point. So a lot of, yeah, baseball is the one sport. The only other sport I think you could really point to is golf because you know, sure. it's golf. Like you have Tiger Woods winning the mat, the, winning the masters at 40 something. Um, but football, you're not having Andrew Luck come out of retirement five years later. And he's just going to basically kind of pick up where he left off, you know, but please, Mr. Luck, come back. If, if you listen to this, please come back. He was in Indianapolis, uh, last week for the Chuck Pagano cancer, um, like gala and he was throwing footballs and stuff. And it was, too painful to watch, like like watching an ex just be with their new boyfriend. Um, right. It's hard, hard to watch. Uh, on to the National League. The New York Mets have a winning record. Congratulations to the New York Mets. Um, I think they got J.D. Martinez back uh, this week. Was it this week or was it a couple weeks ago? It was. I uh, actually had a... is, again, sneaky good. Yeah, I actually had a good week. I, I got to hit... Uh, I hadn't been to a lot of baseball games in the last year. I hit three stadiums in uh, a week. So I was at the game Monday night and Severino had a no hitter into the eighth inning and the Mets found a way to lose. Diaz gave up a two run homer in the ninth. Um, it was a battle of two pitchers who were on the Yankees last year. It was tie on against Severino and the game went full nine innings. It was over in I think two hours and seven minutes it was fantastic. Just the pace of the game. That the Mets are, yeah, they're they're playing pretty well. Actually, you look at the Mets. Uh, the biggest success story this year is this guy Reed Garrett is five and zero with uh, like an ERA under one. And so again, it's just you know, is that going to sustain? He's he's on pace to he's on pace to win thirty games. <laughs> he's a reliever, and you That's know, insane. You, it is insane. It's insane. He, I mean, he was with the Orioles briefly last year. He was with, um, I didn't even realize he, and another guy, he pitched in 2019 for the Tigers. Didn't pitch again until 2022. Just briefly made these appearances. And here he is. He's 5-0 and with a 0 0.57 ERA. I mean, Eric Fetty is another name that comes to mind. He was on the 2019 World Series winning Nationals. He, he wasn't, I don't think he was active in the postseason roster, but he had some some good starts, you know, times throughout that year and went over to was it Japan or Korea. I don't remember. He's come back and he's like the one bright spot for the White Sox this year. And it's just incredible that these guys can reinvent themselves. And the thing is their arms are great. You know, it's just a matter of, can they stay healthy and can they harness them? Yeah. Uh, it's insane to me that the White Sox swept the Rays this weekend and they are at six wins. Yeah, well, they're about to get with swept sweep. with a sweep. By, with the sweep, right? Well, they're about to get they're about to face the Red Sox, and looks like they're going to win their tenth in a row today against. They're playing the White Sox. The Twins are going to sweep the White Sox. They'll play Boston, two teams that are they're hot or just playing over their heads. Um, yeah, White Sox are tough to watch. The Marlins had an insane comeback against another. They're basically their mirror image. The Rockies put five runs in the ninth inning last night to force extras and then won it. Uh, Dane, some guy named Dane Myers, the game winning hit. So it's, baseball's a, a weird sport. And it's just over the course of six months, you're going to see a lot of strange things, peaks and valleys. How about the game, the Dodgers game last night with the bees two hour delay in Arizona. Yeah. I mean, what could that have been about? Right. Well, it's not going to be weather. Well, did, did maybe the uh, those Las Vegas casinos placed it there. They had some sort of bet 
for Shohei. <laughs> yeah, well, what happened uh, was, yeah, the, well, the Diamondbacks were supposed to start Jordan Montgomery. He warmed up. They didn't want him to start, so they pushed him back to today. So you never know. The uh, Yeah, beekeepers are back. Beekeepers, the, uh, I guess they, they had their moment yesterday um, with, with, you know, putting out, getting all the bees out of there. Um, they carted him in. The, the, the entire crowd was applauding him. It was awesome. Um, Major League Baseball, it feels like a couple times a year there's, there's always some sort of bee issue. In, in Major League Baseball, which is one of my favorite things. I saw somebody complaining about um, how all teams don't have at least retractable roofs in baseball anymore. They're like, it's ridiculous. Why are we still doing rainouts? I was like, the NFL has a lightning delay every once in a while. That absolutely does happen. And I think it's the beauty of the sport. I think rainouts, they give you double headers and double headers are awesome. You can't tell me they aren't awesome. And you want to talk about Oh, you're wasting pitchers. You're hurting pitchers. You're not hurting pitchers because of a of a doubleheader. We've been doing doubleheaders since the like 1800s. I'm pretty sure they have done doubleheaders. That is not the thing hurting pitchers. I'm just that that's just not. Yeah, it's it's not. I mean, I was just reading about this guy Pud Galvin. He was they say he was baseball's first cheater. He was he pitched in like the 1800 late 1800s. And he's um, pitched like 145 complete games in his career. Oh I don't even think there's there's not even 145. Some of those stats are insane. Yeah, I mean, there's not even 145 complete games in a season now. Not even close. Yeah. I mean, what? How, how many there are there a season now? I mean, 50. I don't. I don't know if that. Pro- you probably have one once, maybe twice a week. Like yeah, at the, at the right. most, that's twice a week would be about fifty. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, it's crazy. I mean, that's why that Tanner Houck shutout was great. We saw Ranger Suarez throw one. Um, speaking of great early season stories that no one's really talking about, Phillies. By the way, I mean, uh, Phillies first team to twenty wins, and nobody's really talking about them, right? And that and that's how they like it too. They've been in the. They've been in the. NLCS the last two years have been in the World Series as well. I mean, it's crazy people lose sight of these things. But yeah, back to your point. I mean, doubleheaders are great. I I did not like when they did the seven inning doubleheaders during the pandemic. Oh, the as as a former and your ball player as well, doubleheaders even for the players. I don't know how it is for Major League Baseball players. Maybe you're playing too many games. They they probably have a different opinion. But at least as when I would play doubleheaders as a kid, that was like an awesome day. That was the day. Like I waited for all year because I yeah. think once a year they would have a double header or once a season, every team had a double header. You would play the early game at like 8 a.m. And then you sit and wait for an hour, maybe a couple hours. And then you play that the, the late game again. And you're like, man, I just played five hours, six hours of baseball. This was awesome. And as a fan, at least, because you got to remember when when people when fans say things, people are like, oh, well, the players don't like it, so we shouldn't do it. And it's like, you got to remember, these guys are putting out a product. A part of the reason you play the game is for the fans. Without fans, you don't have a league. So you have to accommodate the fans. And from my understanding, all fans love going to doubleheaders. You sit in the ballpark for a couple hours in between games. That's that's awesome. I love that. Well, yeah, I mean, as a player, it's great, especially in, like, the rec leagues, because you get a ton of at-bats. That's what you pay for, you know? I mean, the majors, you're you're worried about your stats, and you'll take your walks. You'll get on base any way you can. In the rec leagues, you want to just get up and have a chance to mash the ball. And uh, so, yeah. yeah, and as a fan, I mean, look, you play 162 games. There's nothing wrong with checking two of them off in one day. And, like, I just, the other part of baseball is weather. And I love having weather affect games as as like just like we love snow games in the nfl Mm -hmm. we like the one thing about basketball i've always wished they've done nba games outside like i know that's really not plausible that's yeah and the same thing with the nhl when they do the stadium series well if they can do nhl games outside and keep the ice cold they can figure out how to do an nba game like at least in florida in the winter i mean come on you can't tell me that you can't have an outdoor game in miami you know, play, well, I would say the Marlins, but of course they play indoors, but, um, I mean, you could do it at the Dolphin Stadium or whatever, right? Like, it would just be really, I'm surprised, because the NBA yeah. is super global. The, they play games in with China in the preseason. They play in all different countries in the regular season. You're telling me you can't play 
can't play a game outdoors that most people actually do play outdoors. Like, um, you know, especially a place like New York. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of crazy game, I know we don't really talk NBA, but crazy finish in that Knicks Sixers game last night. I don't know if you saw it. I happen to be watching it and, and a six point lead with we 27. Are, uh, yeah, I'm going to do the, we're probably going to do an NBA preview. Um, 2023, 2024 NBA preview, uh, within a couple weeks. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're we just gotta, we're, I'm going to, I'm going to treat it like I know nothing about the NBA. I don't know anything that's, I happened. don't know a whole lot. Um, I just know that that was a big meltdown by the, um, Knicks last night, six point lead with, you know, well, it's the Knicks. 30 seconds. Right. Right. Tyrese Maxey yeah. just went off there, uh, fourth quarter, late in the fourth quarter in overtime. So. Um, so we only have a few minutes left. Um, I want to cover the uniforms. The ma- Major League Baseball, for the first time ever, Major League Baseball has finally listened to the fans and done the right thing. They have made the right choice. They said that the uniforms are going to be changed um, by that the latest, the 2025 season, although I feel like they're going to have it ready for the postseason, at least. I feel like that's actually pretty reasonable. Um, or maybe even September when, you know, Obviously, you have chases down the stretch and stuff. Um, they're going to fix the lettering. They are going to fix the discolorations. And they said they're going to attempt to fix the sweat issue. And Fanatics has been um, what's it, absolved or uh, acquitted, um, you know, as, as O.J. Simpson was, acquitted <laughs> of all charges of being bad at producing uniforms. Although we're not, I'm not acquitting them of being just horrible at fan merchandise. Their fan merchandise is still God awful. And you can ask any NHL fans, NHL fans are sick and tired of the fanatics uniforms, but for the first time fanatics actually has a little bit of good press. So um, yeah, we just don't have to talk about major league baseball uniforms anymore, which is, I, I put out a video a couple weeks ago or a couple days ago saying that this might, this could be tracking to be one of the worst seasons in Major League Baseball history, which people said I was overreacting. I I feel like when you have constant uniform issues and a gambling scandal by an MLB employee and you have a team that is basically openly following the script of Major League trying to tank, that's pretty, like, obviously more things have to go wrong, but that is pretty reasonable to say this could be one of the worst seasons in history yeah uh, it's uh, I, don't, I don't know what what to say about the uniform thing been talking about it way too long in in society it, now mike trout's out i mean he's one of the good guys one yeah. of the marketable guys otani's in la see i liked when otani was with the angel it gave you a reason to watch that team you, you already would watch the dodgers i mean you're already going to watch them they have Mookie yeah. Betts and freddie freeman and glass now and yama i mean they buy whoever they want but it's like Otani, I mean, if you put him in like Detroit or you put him in, I mean, not that you can put him there. I wish you could, but you know, it, baseball, they just, I don't know. I, I, I and then that's a problem because in football, three agents will sign wherever. I mean, right. It's not market size. It's not money that always drives it, you know, where players go and then the teams can market teams do already do a good job of marketing, but in baseball, your superstar players are mostly going to be going to the same teams. And it's just yeah. not going to – and then you're not going to be able to to market the rest of the league in the same way. Yeah, when, when Otani went to the Angels, I was like, that is like one of the – that is the, one of the most boring places for him to go. Like I was like, I'm very disappointed that that of all places because you already have Mike Trout. And when Otani was there, it felt like Trout was in his shadow. It was like, well, you just have this extra guy who's a generational talent and Mike Trout who was just kind of there you know, cause he's been there for so long. And then the year that Otani leaves and Mike Trout is like finally finding his form. And he's the, he's now like, again, the King of the angels, then he gets hurt again. And it, it was like heartbroken. And then obviously when Otani goes to the Dodgers, you're like, Oh, God damn it. Like, of course he has to go to the, again, the most boring place he could have gone. There are, well, yeah. 28 other more interesting teams I think he could have gone to. Even the Yankees, I think, would have been more interesting. Yeah, I would have been Dodgers. okay with that. I think I think it would have been, you know, again, I think because L.A. has just sort of cornered the market on these big free agents now, and I think the fact that um, they're already so loaded, there's all these teams that, that needed him, could have used him for many reasons, yeah. not just 
on the field, obviously being the primary, but off the field and then all that smoke that was blowing about the Blue Jays being the team and maybe the Cubs were in on it or the Giants. And then it was, oh, but he didn't go to the Giants because free agents don't want to go to San Francisco. I don't know. I think it's a shame. I think that's where baseball will always fall short, even though we love it for other reasons. It's it's hard to stomach that we're just never going to get a case where an Otani type player is going to go to the A's, right? Or to the Tigers or to the yeah. Royals. I'll, I'll end on this note and then we'll wrap up. Um, I think a lot of sports fans are a little sick and tired. The wet, there's a West, it almost feels like there's a West coast bias when it comes to coverage of sports. Like the Lakers were a middle tier team. Like they, they were in the play in this year. Right. Why should we care? I have no, I do not care about the Lakers and the amount that they cover it, cover them. And they've always been like that. It's always been the Lakers because they are the LA Lakers. They're always going to get coverage. But I think it just has to do with the West Coast. Like, not a lot of people really care about the West Coast because I think, like, 40 or 50% of the country lives on the East Coast in the Eastern time zone. We just don't care. I do not care. I care about the teams that I don't have to stay up until 1 a.m. to watch. I care about the teams that are near me. Like, we just – I really just do not care about – about the West in the way that I think the media wants you to care. I would, I hate the Yankees, but I would much rather hear about the Yankees than the Dodgers or the Angels. I honestly, like, even when it comes to West Coast, I don't consider Seattle as a, quote, West Coast aura. You know what I mean? Like, they are much more reserved up in Seattle versus L.A. It almost feels like they're kind of forcing it down your throat. Like, you, you have the A's moving to Sacramento. And they're not going to get, you know, no Sacramento team gets coverage. Like they only, so maybe I haven't, maybe I'm anti LA and that's it. I don't care about, I don't care about anything LA. I know I am. Yeah. Everyone else I'm fine with. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and um, I, thought, I thought where you were going with that and I'll just end with this, you know, I think for, for Japanese born players, it, I wouldn't, I don't think bias is the right word, but there's an unfair advantage that West coast teams are going to inherently have with Japanese players uh, because, you know, obviously just, comfort and being closer to home. Um, and so it yeah. felt inevitable that Otani was just going to pick a West coast team, which is why he picked the, picked the angels in the first place. Um, and in Yamamoto, whether was it Otani himself or was it just being on the West coast that swayed him and, you know, Ichiro many moons ago. And um, so that's another thing too, you know, you wish that it was more of a level playing field for the international players who'd want to come to the East coast. I mean, why wouldn't, you know, Otani want to come to Boston if it was, if there weren't those geographical factors. And, and again, I, I, I'm like extending it. If you think about like, there's four teams on the West coast, right? You have the, you have the Mariners, you have the, uh, no, oh God, the Giants, well, you have the athletics and that's not Padres. including the Dodgers and the Padres you have there. There's four other teams there. Why should I give a shit about the Dodgers who underperform in the in the biggest stage every single year, I want to hear about yeah maybe the Mariners underperform, maybe the the Padres underperform, maybe the Giants underperform, but at least like I don't have to have them shoved down my throat. I don't I don't want to hear about the Dodgers all the time. I want to hear about the Mariners. The Mariners also, I think they're a better looking team just like colorway wise. Yeah, better logo, a lot more fun stadium, much and more the Giants. Yeah. Better stadium, much better stadium, um, better uniforms as well than than the Dodgers. Um, San Francisco is like you know they had Willie Mays, they have a lot of beautiful history. ballpark. And obviously, the Dodgers beautiful have ballpark too. in San yeah, Francisco. Beautiful ballpark. You know, in spite of what's happened, Padres, bit, the city, but <laughs> yeah. but the Dodgers. Padres, I will say, the, what's that? Padres are mad to me. The yeah, athletics. Well, that, the when the athletics are good, baseball is better. That's just. I think baseball is better. When and the A's playing. have themselves a, a chance. They're playing the Pirates. They get the Marlins coming in this weekend. And then they face Texas. And we'll see if they're ready to stack up. But I just wanted to close and say I, I hated watch. I hate watching games on TV at Dodger Stadium. I hate the, what feels like fake fan noise. I hate seeing the palm trees. I hated being at the games. I went to an NLCS game in 2013 <laughs> against the Cardinals. And it could not have felt less like postseason baseball. It was hard to believe. It felt like a, a barely – above a spring training game with the, the the level of energy and the fact that it was like 
I mean, I wouldn't say there were more Cardinal fans in the crowd per se, but it just, it, you just look in the weather, the vibe, it just never felt like postseason baseball. And you've seen, if you've, you've just watched, you know, the Phillies when they're in the postseason, the Orioles were in the postseason, obviously the Red Sox, and Yankees. I mean, those places are electric. They shake. There is, the crowd is actually a factor and you like watching, I mean, even if it's the Yankees, we have, but you like watching because it feels like real post plus it's cold, right? October, it's supposed to be cold. You're not supposed to be 80 degrees looking at palm trees in, in you know, the NLCS or the World Series. And so that's my, another big beef, one of the many I have with the Dodgers. But um, yeah. All right. Well, anti, anti Dodgers. I love anti, just Los Angeles in general. I love anti Los Angeles. Angeles. I, I lived there Los for a few Angeles. years. I can be as anti Los Angeles as you want. Yeah. All right. So make sure to like, comment, subscribe, the whole the whole thing. Um, make sure to check out Draft America as always, and we will see you on Monday.